Thanks, Tony. Um, I should start by saying a thank you to everybody that's been involved in this project. Certainly, um, the, the department and the, the fellowship uh, 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 has really been what's allowed us the freedom to work on this project. And then, as Tony mentioned, support from the Office of Entrepreneurship and Innovation has really also given us some of the resources to, to develop this from the early stage ideas into something that we're hopefully able to disseminate. But um, let me, hmm. there we go. Um, so today's talk is going to be a little uh, sort of a mishmash of a few things. So we're going to try to um, go through a few pieces of this that are more theoretical and then go towards, by the end, talking about what we practically have developed and what our roadmap looks like. So the idea is going to be to, to walk through essentially the development process and the, the theory and both and then the logistics of what we've actually built. Um, so our goal is initially to talk a little bit about clinical decision support and then also to discuss what Mark and I over the course of this fellowship and this project have learned by meeting with 30 different institutions about where they are with clinical decision support governance and what their needs are. Uh, and then I'll turn it over to Mark to discuss some of the, the technology and interoperability pieces that allow a platform like this to function. And then um, Mark will sort of go from there, talk about what our future roadmap looks like. So I'm going to start with this scenario um, to, to sort of help understand what the context of this work is, which is this idea of what, how a physician derives um, or, or knows how to get knowledge, right, or gets support in, in, for what they're trying to do. So the example that we use is I'm a physician. I go see a patient who's female who happens to have traveled to Miami last week. I know that Zika is in the news, that it's in Miami, but I don't really know much more than that, right? So in order to figure out what to do for this patient, first thing I do is go to the CDC's website where I find out that actually it's not all of Miami. It's specific counties, uh, specifically Miami Beach and Wynwood is what it was when I last checked, where their Zika has now become endemic and is a concern if the patient traveled to those areas. And then suppose the patient had traveled to those areas, right? Then I go and I have to find either on the CDC's website or ideally this email that I got from our local Department of Public Health, which actually summarizes what the recommendations are into this nice table um, where I go look and say, okay, this is a female. She's actually symptomatic because she has a fever uh, and uh, she was exposed four to seven days ago. So I'm actually supposed to get both a serum and a urine PCR and a serum IgM, right? And that's the specificity where things often fall apart. Like a lot of people get that I'm that they're supposed to get to the point where they're supposed to do something about Zika, but you know, in our conversations with the CDC, we and even the local public health department, we find that not every time is the urine PCR getting ordered. It's not everyone is uh, not every time is everyone getting the optimal care, and you can probably understand why, right? It's because the knowledge evolves so rapidly that it's just hard to keep up. And this is a problem that's not unique to public health concerns. So um, in 1950, if I was a physician who graduated medical school, the doubling time of medical knowledge was 50 years. So I could essentially practice my entire career based on what I learned when I graduated and be fine. By 1980, though, that time was down to seven years. Um, this is all based on uh, estimates of the medical literature from a physician at the University of Iowa. And by 2010, you have what I got when I started medical school, where they told me that half of what I uh, learned in medical school would be obsolete within five years. Um, the estimate he came up with is actually a little less than that, which is three and a half years. What's especially concerning, right, is that in the next decade, it's projected to get down to the point where it's under a year. And so this idea that a physician can be reliably expected to know what they don't know is just not a tenable model going forward. And so that's where this idea of clinical decision support comes in, right? Clinical decision support is, um, this is how the, the ONC defines it, is um, something that provides clinicians, staff, patients, other individuals with knowledge and person-specific information that's either in, uh, intelligently filtered or presented at appropriate times to enhance health and health care. The, the, the key aspect of this, right, is that it removes that need for the physician or whatever other provider to know what they don't know 
and instead can actually provide in-context information that tells you, hey, here's something that you may not already know about this patient, or you may be able to figure out, but it's highly inefficient because you have to scan through a large volume of data in the patient chart, and by showing it to you here, we're helping you make the right decision at the right time. So there's been a lot of literature um, on clinical decision support, especially in about the last 25 years as a, real, a field that really started growing in the early 90s, um, although back then it was primarily in the context of custom-built electronic health records. Now we're at the point where the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT actually includes this as part of their uh, future roadmap uh, for the learning health ecosystem. So those of you who were at the talk last month heard a talk from um, uh, Levan Yutijin and Charlie Bailey about the first, uh, the top half of this, right, where we're con where PedsNet functions as a, to uh, a database that essentially go from individual patient level data quickly or more rapidly to the level of public generalizable knowledge um, by constructing research. Now we're talking about the other way back, right? So we, we already have mechanisms in place where public health policy and clinical guidelines get made based on this data, but in order for it to make it back to the individual patient level is really where clinical decision support comes in. Um, so examples of clinical decision support some of them you're probably familiar with, like order sets. Um, so we use this extensively at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. We embed it. So here's an example of somebody in diabetic ketoacidosis. It tells you what the initial labs are to order, what the initial treatments are. But then there are simpler things. So this is actually something that I used to use during my residency. Um, this is a document when we were on a paper chart. So you don't need an electronic health record to do this, right? If you look at the bottom line of every note that I wrote on every patient, I verified for myself uh, what the code status is for that patient for that day. Had I ordered appropriate prophylaxis for DVTs? Did I offer them something for pain control? And what was I planning what their eventual disposition was going to be, right? Then when you do have electronic health records, you can make this somewhat better, right? That same DVT prophylaxis can then transition to what we have here at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, where um, there's actually something that evaluates the patient's risk factors um, based on nursing documentation in this case, and then prompts the physician to make the right decision to order, um, order um, prophylaxis. So what do we already know about what makes clinical decision support systems work? So this is a review by a physician named Ken Kawamoto at the University of Utah, where he reviewed um, 71 studies and saw what were the key factors to making decision support work. And you'll hear a few themes as I go through a few of these studies. One is this idea that we need to automate decision support as part of a clinician's workflow, right? So you don't want in this, that example where I showed you where the clinician's leaving their existing workflow in the electronic health record, going to the CDC website, going to their email. If you create workflows like that, they're unlikely to succeed. Um, second is that you want to provide the decision support at the time and location of decision making. Third, you want to provide an actionable recommendation rather than an assessment of the patient. And then last, at the time, at the time that this review came out, we were still um, mostly a paper-based system in hospitals, and it turned out that computer-based generation of decision support was actually uh, effective, probably primarily due to the, the efficiency and the time involved there. Um, the, uh, uh, there was a book that came out um, by a number of authors which introduced this idea uh, of the five rights framework. In other words, that in order to make clinical decision support work, there were five key elements that you had to get the right information to the right person in the right format, so as a checklist, as an advisory, uh, through the right channel, so whether that's within the EHR or whether that's a, an email or um, something else, and then at the right time, right? It goes back to that idea of you want it at the time of decision support. So this is often the way that a lot of people characterize um, or summarize the, the findings from that review from Dr. Kawamoto. And then similarly, there's another framework um, that was um, authored by David Bates uh, from, in Boston, which talked about the 10 commands of effective clinical decision support. And I'm going to focus on a few of these here. One, obviously, is speed. Um, we talked about that with the relevance to the, the computer. but. Um, also, you know, the, you know, the speed workflow, uh, trying to get people to not stop, but to redirect them to the right path, and focusing on simple interventions all sort of focus on the actual initial design. But there are two pieces of this that are especially relevant to healthcare organizations as they're 
thinking about how they manage their clinical decision support systems, and these, it's these last two pieces here. And, and it's this idea that in order for it to work, uh, and those of you that are from the world of quality improvement, right, probably recognize that these, these are no-brainers, that you actually need to not just implement, which is often what happens now, but that you actually need to monitor outcomes from the implementation of the decision support and look at how the tool is functioning um, and whether or not you're getting the outcomes you want. And then second, that they need to be managed and maintained, which gets back to that initial problem that I started with, right? This idea that information and knowledge that's contained within decision support evolves over time, and so it's essential that that information gets maintained. So given that that requirement and that need um, really exists for healthcare institutions, we want to talk about how um, healthcare organizations are keeping up with this. So the Zika guidelines themselves, again, like I said, have been sort of the, our basis for how we've approached this when we spoke with now 30 institutions in validating our work. And they've had three major, multiple minor revisions in the past year alone. And we, uh, we posed the questions to them and collected data in a qualitative manner to say, hey, how do you guys keep up with stuff like this? Right? Um, and there's actually a few best practices that have been published around this work. Um, you may notice some of these authors are the same as the, as the authors on the Ten Commandments paper, but what they suggest for organ at the organizational level right, is that clinical decision support be viewed broadly. So that goes back to that slide I showed you earlier that there's actually, you know, I showed you three of actually um, multiple forms of decision support and how it can be delivered. But in other words, to not think about it simply as one format or another. Second is to think about uh, moving forward with simple clinical decision support no matter what your size. So that's been an interesting one um, when we've had these conversations with these institutions because it's not, there have actually been large institutions that have still told us, look, we haven't moved forward with clinical decision support because we just don't have the organizational infrastructure to make this happen. And by that, what they really mean is that they don't know how to institute the change management process, right? So we met with a large community hospital over um, uh, 500 providers who still, uh, and who has uh, a chief medical information officer who has an informatics infrastructure, but who told us that they've only built six pieces of clinical decision support since their electronic health record went live multiple years ago. And it's because they haven't cobbled together all the expertise um, to go from the start to the finish of the clinical decision support life cycle. And I'll talk about what that is in a little bit. Um, Third is this idea of focusing on inline CDS. So a lot of what people think about, right, um, and why people cringe when they think about clinical decision support is that they think about it as the pop-up alert that shows up when you're trying to do something else. It interrupts what you're doing and makes you say yes or no to the screen that may or may not be relevant to what you're doing right then. But it turns out that those are often the worst ways to, to implement clinical decision support and, and, and um, work locally done here by Eric Shalov around drug-drug interactions has shown that if we actually reduce the amount of clinical decision support that's implemented around these drug-drug interactions and focus only on the highly precise ones, that we can actually improve both the um, follow-through on the decision support but then also improve the accuracy of the work that people are doing. So this idea of like moving away from interruptive things to actually get people to help them make the right decision, again, is a sort of a recurring theme from what you probably heard me talk about earlier. Um, but, and then the last two pieces are where, like, so while I said that number two, you know, some organizations have been struggling with, so of our 30 institutions, it's about three to five that sort of fit into that category. Where things really start to fall apart now in uh, what healthcare institutions are able to do is number four and number five, right? Uh, number four says, use what's available from your vendor, but plan to customize CDS. The reality is that if um, you use Epic or Cerner, it's not that you uh, have to plan to customize CDS, you almost entirely have to customize CDS, right? Because what these major electronic health record vendors now offer you is essentially a tool bucket that, give, that says, all right, here's uh, an engine, you know, here's a tool that lets you configure clinical decision support and how you wanna build it, and you guys build it yourselves and maintain all the knowledge. 
And, and it's often not the implementation stage, but number five, the knowledge management stage where things fall apart, uh, fall apart entirely. The vast majority of institutions that we talk to don't have a process for periodic review um, and don't have the ability to revisit whatever knowledge that they've implemented in clinical decision support to make sure that it's up to date. And as you can imagine with something like Zika, that becomes a significant problem very quickly. Um, this is uh, a quote from um, the CMIO of a mid-Atlantic hospital that actually tries to do all five of those things, but even for them, this is a problem, right? He said, we try to be agile about keeping up with these changes for decision support, but we're doing it at an immense cost in resources. And fundamentally, that's the issue, right? Is that each institution is replicating a lot of this work. Um, and, and so we sort of set out to think about, all right, what are the pieces of work that you can actually um, generalize and what are the pieces of work that each institution needs to continue to do. So here's um, uh, what's been described as the clinical decision life support, uh, sorry, the clinical decision support life cycle. Um, so there's sort of four key steps in going from some clinical knowledge to decision support, right? One is you have to figure out what are the key elements of logic, right? Who is the patient that's at risk? When do they need to be identified? What is it, what's the actionable recommendation for that patient? Then you need to formalize the definitions and logic conditions. So somebody with diabetes can be defined by a number of criteria. They could be defined by the A1C, they could be defined by their fasting glucose. What is it that, that is the exact data criteria that defines whether or not somebody uh, meets the elements that you defined uh, in the statement above? Third, you need to identify the workflow scenarios, right? And that goes back to the five rights. When's the right time to show it? Who needs to see it? And how do they need to see it? And then lastly is the conversion to the target representation or the platform. So if you decide it's something that's going to be in the electronic health record, how do you actually implement it within the electronic health record? So you can imagine there's sort of two portions of this that are actually fundamentally generalizable, right? Identifying who the patient is that's at risk. Um, and formalizing the definition of that at-risk patient as well as what the actionable knowledge is around that patient is something that's, if like you looked at that Zika guideline, that's exactly what it does, right? It says, here's the at-risk patient. It's somebody who's symptomatic, who's had a fever, or, or sorry, who's symptomatic like having a fever, who is pregnant, and who's been exposed in the last week. And then it tells you what the actionable logic is, which is to order those three tests. That's true no matter whether you show up at a hospital in Philadelphia, in Florida, in Seattle, wherever. And so those are the pieces that any sort of platform that tries to make this process more efficient needs to be able to, to generalize. But then these other pieces are entirely custom. How a four clinician small practice handles that information is going to be entirely different from a large emergency room with a number of physician extenders who could, who could use that information in a different way. And so that has some significant implications then for the scope of work. Um, when we met with the CDC at the Public Health Informatics Conference this year, one of the things they posed to us was to say, look, we're really struggling with what is the work that we should be doing, right? We've done things where we've actually built a piece of decision support from start to finish and then handed it and, and custom built it for one electronic health record and, and actually managed it for an institution but that doesn't seem like an efficient use of our resources, and that's true, right? So if you think about, again, sticking with that what's generalizable, what's institution-specific piece, we can actually probably think about dividing up the work in these two columns. So if we look at a public health institution, they're the ones that are the experts on the knowledge itself, right? So they're responsible for authoring and maintaining the CDS knowledge, but also defining the logic and the terms, because that's really the thing that allows you to eliminate institution to institution variation and in how, it, how it gets implemented. And then that then means that they have to agree on some format of the, the decision support knowledge. Um, we call it a knowledge artifact that can then make it to the institution who then is responsible for integrating it into their workflows, and they have to continue to do the work to assess the impact and, and uh, review that it's being used as intended, but hopefully by removing some of the design and the, and the definition work that they will now actually free up the resources to do this kind of work to the point where they can actually start developing feedback on the knowledge that the public health community is putting out and saying, hey, this piece of knowledge is actually useful or this is something that's not working and get that feedback back to the, the public health uh, guideline maker. And this is where we think 
There's uh, the role for the bridge of what we call a CDS integrator, um, like our platform, is to essentially get the format, uh, formatted CDS knowledge into the institution and then get feedback from the institution back to the public health community. That still requires a lot of technology pieces to make it work. So transitioning from the, the theory to the implementation piece of this, I'm going to turn it over to Mark. So, so yeah, so I'm uh, one of the other clinical informatics fellows. I'm an emergency physician, but uh, I've also have a, a long background in software development, engineering. I've been really interested in building tools that that um, uh, like websites of all different kinds throughout residency, medical school. Uh, so when I came to uh, residency and I started seeing this plethora of data in the electronic health record system, I was like, this would be a great way of building tools for clinicians, for patients, if we can only get access to that data. But it was extraordinarily difficult. And, and uh, one of my focuses in this fellowship has been trying to figure out what are the new standards? What are the ways of kind of bringing this together? So one of the reasons that this has really picked up recently is shown by this graph, which is um, talking about EHR uh, adoption by hospital system. And you can see that there's a huge upswing uh, starting in about 2009, and that's due to the High Tech Act, which implemented something called meaningful use, which was subsidizing hospitals to implement electronic health record systems. So starting in about 2009, 2010, hospitals found a big financial motive to start adopting electronic health record systems. So you can see between 2009 and now 2015, um, uh, up to 83, 96%, I think the last we had seen in 2016 was definitely in the 90s. So essentially any hospital you go to nowadays has an electronic health record system. Um, and this was an interesting quote, so this is from Karen DeSalvo, one of the former heads of the ONC, and she said, we started with the goal of everyone having an electronic health record, and we succeeded, now everyone has 10 electronic health records, which really goes to this point of, of we did a great job of getting these EHRs out there, but the problem was really integrating the data together um, to allow different hospitals, different EHRs to communicate with each other, make sure that a patient just has one chart, because as the clinicians or even patients in this room will know, uh, when you go to one office, you have to repeat everything because they can't talk with the other office. And in this day and age, a lot of patients are very surprised by this because everywhere you go, everything is getting integrated really easily, financial institutions. Um, so in healthcare, it's definitely lagged behind. But this was the, the strategic roadmap for, for what the ONC was trying to do. And they started off with this collect uh, goal, which was goal one. And that's really, let's just get health IT on the roadmap. Let's just make sure everyone's focusing on that. Uh, and I think Meaningful Use definitely did a good job of, of getting hospitals to, to digitize their patient records. But their goal number two now is now let's try and share all this data, make sure it's interoperable. Obviously, uh, there are things like HIPAA, which we need to be very concerned about, and, and hospitals are very wary of, of making sure that data is being shared in a secure way. But I think everyone's starting to come to terms with their, there are safe and secure ways to do this. Uh, and then the last, the last step is, is using this data. So now that we have all this data, everything's being shared, let's turn it into something useful. So to make this work, there, there are a lot of standards out there. This isn't just unique to healthcare, but as far as sending messages from one electronic health record to another, or, or from one system to another, FHIR has really come onto the scene as, as the one that people are most excited about and the most hyped about. Um, and FHIR stands for Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources. Uh, and it, what essentially does, um, I don't want to get too technical, but but the, the way that the old kind of accepted standards that are used everywhere in healthcare is something called HL7 version 2. And uh, when you compare that to common uh, web technologies that Facebook, Twitter, all of these websites out there are using, they were completely black and white, completely separate. Um, so what FHIR tried to do was incorporate some of those modern web standards so that any developer 
the, the learning curve would be a lot lower to, to access that data. Um, and it, it's referred to as resources because they, they uh, put them into different buckets and they call those a resource. So a resource could be a patient. So if you wanted to do a query on what a patient was, you could get that data about their birthday, um, their address, their phone number, and so on. And then an observation is if I want to get the patient's uh, heart rate or some other uh, blood value, um, I could query it off of that. So they have these different resources that make it very easy to query off of. Taking this one step further, there's a, a framework called Smart on Fire, and this was actually uh, the folks at Boston Children's have been doing a lot of work in the space due to a, a large grant that they got. And, and the goal there was to create an app store, this idea of interchangeable applications that could just plug into the electronic health record system. Uh, and it's built on top of that fire standard. So it kind of put authentication, security, as well as the, the messaging platform all within one framework. And I'm gonna show you just a couple of applications. This is probably hard to see but this was taken from Cerner's website. They've been working, uh, Boston Children's uses Cerner, so they've been working closely together to, to come up with example applications. Um, this is a growth chart application. So you can see that it's within the EHR, it's within the workflow, uh, but you can kind of make it really pretty. Again, this is just using common web-based web uh, standards. So any developer, any web developer could create something like this, create, um, a tool that was interactive, but also visual, visually appealing without working within the confines of the electronic health records um, native builders. Another one for those, this probably doesn't show up very well either, but for those of you that are familiar with Visual DX, they created their own smart app. Um, so instead of needing to log into a different system and typing in, this can automatically pull in the patient's age uh, and other criteria that are deemed relevant and then allowing you to, in this visual interface, go down. So going back to what Naveen said, integrating this into the workflow and taking away those additional steps uh, are a recipe for having better, um, better uptake from clinicians. So now I'm gonna talk quickly about phrase. I wanna make sure we have some time for questions, but so again, this is our, our platform that we've been developing. Um, and we've, we've changed around that model from what Naveen had, had mentioned. So the clinician is, is in their clinic, They're, they have the patient's chart open, and what we're doing is we're sending that data in a secure way out to the cloud, uh, which is where the phrase platform lives. And then we're actually working with the public health departments to populate the rules and the knowledge within our platform. And then if the patient meets any of those actionable um, criteria, they'll get uh, an alert back into the system that's notifying the, the physician of that uh, patient being at risk. So one thing that is important to do for anyone who's on the organizational side is you start generating all this knowledge and phrase, there's a concern that you're gonna open up the floodgates and you're gonna get alert fatigue because all of the alerts are now just gonna be showing up for these patients. And, and as a lot of clinicians know, these, these alerts are, are not kind of looked at too, uh, too positively. Um, a lot of times they're ignored. So uh, we're giving tools to the organization to not only track their effectiveness, but also track which ones they deem appropriate for them. So we represent this with uh, public health expert one and public health expert two. So one might be the CDC and let's say two is the local Philadelphia Department of Public Health. And they're each gonna populate different buckets of knowledge that they have. So alert A might be Ebola, alert B might be Zika, and alert C might be flu. Um, so, so the institution might be happy uh, with A, B, and E. Um, and you'll see that the, the local uh, public health department, number two at the bottom, they also have an alert B. So they have their own Zika guideline, which they actually prefer. So the, the institution can go through and say, you know what, I don't want uh, alert B and alert C from the CDC. Either we already do this appropriately or we don't deem that this is something that, uh, that we need in our system. But you know what, for the other ones, we wanna to subscribe to those and we wanna bring those through 
and we're going to get feedback about how they're performing because they can always turn this off at a later time. Uh, and this is going to get a little bit more technical and it's a little messy, but how the data is flowing, this, you can look at it in a, in a clockwise manner, but uh, this can also go synchronously. So the, the clinical encounter is going on in the, the upper left. Uh, the patient's chart is accessed, so the data gets sent out to the phrase engine. Um, and this is all the PHI is staying within that kind of large blue box. But uh, the, patient, the public health uh, department is populating against the data model into the cloud. And those rules are just getting sent across the firewall, so there's no PHI that actually leaves the firewall. Um, and then we're using fire requests against the EHR data to, to see what are the characteristics of this patient. And then that phrase engine in the middle is what's actually the rule engine. So that's the one that's saying, all right, we have all of the criteria coming from public health. We have all of the data coming from the EHR. Now it's cranking through and saying, are any of these criteria being met? And if they are, it's going to send a, a CDS response back to the, uh, the clinical, uh, the, the provider. So I think I just have a couple more slides. So, so where we've been and where we're going, uh, as, as Tony mentioned, uh, we've won a couple of, of awards uh, in January. We were chosen as an initial finalist for this Health 2.0 Closing the Data Divide Challenge. Um, and, and in that May, we were uh, decided as the winner and, and we got to speak at a, a large conference in Bethesda, which was a great experience. Uh, in July, we were chosen as one of the phase one winners of the, the ONC Provider User Experience Challenge. Um, and actually phase two for that, our applications are due in two weeks. So we're, we're pedal to the metal right now trying to get that in place. Um, uh, and to that point, one of the requirements is that we have it running in production. Um, so we are testing with the, the local Philadelphia public health department with some of their public health advisories, uh, and we are going to be trialing it with some select providers in the ambulatory setting here at CHOP. And then as we continue to move on, we've been talking to a lot of other institutions in the area. Um, obviously, using a platform like this at one institution works, but really where you, where you get a lot of the power is by having multiple institutions all be able to subscribe to the same knowledge put out by a, a, a local expert like the, the Department of Public Health. And some of the aims for these pilots, uh, we have a lot of questions, uh, as I'm sure you do, about does this work. Um, so we're going to see, once you start looking at data quality from different electronic health records, um, trying to identify what those data problems are, to what extent they exist, and, um, and try to identify if, if we can mitigate that in an easy way or it's going to be a lot more time-intensive, laborious process. Uh, some of the work that uh, LaVon and Charlie Bailey are doing with PEDSnet, that um, they've been doing a significant amount of this data quality work, even if it's standards-based. Um, Another goal is uh, to try and figure out how the workflows uh, are being maintained uh, at these institutions. So what process does it need to go to if we implement it at a new institution as far as affecting their workflows? Does it make it more difficult or, as we hope, will it make it uh, easier to, to change? Um, obviously, patient outcomes are the gold standard. Uh, I think that's going to be something we uh, eventually try to address, but is not going to be one of the first things that, that we look at. And then finally, once we move all of the, the decision building outside of the, the local EHR and the institutional change processes, is this going to save time? Uh, is it going to save the IS time for not having to implement all of these individual changes, not just to CHOP, but every um, institution? So is it going to save them time and money when they want to try and scale this. So that is the last side. So obviously, um, we're really excited about this project, and we're open to any kind of feedback or questions that you guys may have.